So, this works. Uh, so today and then when the next few lectures will be more talking more about protein structure. Someone asked a bit about that yesterday. And so that's certainly one part of bioinformatics. I will try it, maybe to get into some other part today and I'll, I haven't really decided how I organized the last couple of lectures. Excuse me, before yeah. we begin, mm -hmm. um, could you also again go through the first uh, the primary secondary temporary and quarterary? Okay, I'll do that in the I think I have a slide about it. So that I'll, I'll, I'll comb that in a second. So I'll do that. So actually, actually part of this lecture is, is I mean, the bioinformatics part is about secondary structure prediction, so that's predicting the secondary structures. But I will talk a bit about, a bit general about why you want to have structure and how what structure is, and a bit about structure features, more biophysics of. Protein structure also, so I will try to do that. But the, but the, so the, bi but the bioinformatics part is really some main and secondary structure. So the, you get just yes, you go to paper, while well, you go to Wikipedia page, and at least it's one one part of that is about secondary structure. If it is, but it, it comes other parts also. And then basically I describe this is very short, the Gore method. But it's uh, this is a classical paper, the PhD paper. It's one actually there was several papers in more or less, I think there was actually a couple of earlier papers more or less at the same time, but that was one I found easily available. So I think he published 10 papers about more or less the same thing. Uh, and then there are more, if you want to read more, there you can see all the software down here, and then more about the secondary structure itself, you can go there. Not the prediction, but... So if you're, if you're particular for the people who don't have really biochemistry background. So I will, as I said, I will start with the interaction protein structures, so I will cover your part there. Uh, I go through particularly these three methods, or these two methods mainly, but I will mention some other methods also quite briefly. So Structure of proteins is something that is has been an increasingly large part of biochemistry or biophysics, in particular in Sweden. So it's like it's extremely dominating in Sweden, but also in other parts of the world. And why do we want to do do we want to do that? Is it, what is really why is the structure so important? And I mean, the, two, the really excellent example is, is of course the DNA helix. Once you had a model of it, you really understood the biology. So if you really, before you had, you know, realized it was a helix and how it looked like, how evolution could, or how genetic material could be copied from one cell to another cell and become duplicated, was quite rather unclear. I mean, it was, you know what basic components you had there, but how did you get information from one part or another? Was even people thought there was, there was a protein they caught it, that did it. But what the structure was solved, and I think it's like a short paper in Nature. It's, just, uh, it's a short mention, I think, in the last paragraph, something saying that it hasn't skipped our attention that th this structure provides explanation to how genetic information is transferred. I mean, it doesn't, it's just one page or two pages to the article. But it really shows you how much structure can explain function. So, really, in many cases, really, the structure provides function. So it, it gives you, I mean, also for enzymes and for I mean, any pro, many protein structures have a lot of information. It's not always the case. There are a number of cases where people have solved the structure of a protein, and still you have no idea what it does. Because it's uh, now has been this from a structure genomics perspective. You basically take any gene and you try to predict, try to solve the structure. In the same cases, you had no idea what it did before, and actually. Once you get the structure, you don't know that much more. It's like, well, you can have like, some ideas, rough ideas, there are some rough ideas, but exactly what it does, you still don't know. But often you get ideas about things like active sites, binding sites, confirmation, so, so really what part of it is, is uh, important. And particularly if you combine this with bioinformatics analysis, you can, for its active sites and binding sites, often conserved in the multiple sequence alignments, they are, if you then look at structure, you can find some regions of structures that are extremely conserved and on the surface and in the Bit of space, you can bind. You can uh, have something bind to it. You can say, oh, this is binding site. 
If you have different version of structure, you're going to get confirmation changes. Like structure is like one fixed model in our mind, but certainly there are a lot of dynamics. So a lot, a lot of cases we have in, interesting structure changes, confirmation changes. I mean, one of the classical problems was just in myoglobin and hemoglobin. So how does the oxygen get into the heme? So the heme is in the middle of this globular globin structure with a lot of helices around. And it's not really a space for an oxygen to so go there, so it has to be the quite a lot of dynamics, not a tunnel in there. So you have to think take into dynamics into account. There is an idea that structure and function is cons more conserved than sequence. So basically, if you find it's easy to find homology, both uh, function similarity, if you have a structure. That is probably true that the structure is more conserved, but on the other, I mean, but it's not always the case because structure can also change quite rapidly. We have a single point mutation that, that makes the protein unfold. Uh, but you have, uh, I don't know, average is true, and it's clearly there have been, and particularly earlier days when you had no similar structure that. The structure, solving the structure really put a lot of new, I mean, found a lot of homologies, a lot of relationship between proteins that you didn't realize before. Nowadays, given that the sequence databases are so great and our methods to use alignments is much better, it's less common. However, to get the structure is expensive and difficult. It has been, basically, you have two methods that, well, nowadays, maybe three. And you have particularly you have X-ray crystallography, this is a classical method. So the their really bottleneck is to get good crystals. So you take a protein, you purify it, and you're trying to get it to crystallize somehow. And this is really basically just some kind of random search. You set up a trial with a lot of different conditions, and you see if you get something that looks like oh this looks like a promising crystals, and then you keep on trying changing the concentration of things a little bit, and luckily you can get better and better crystals. And then there are, of course, now there's been, it's much better nowadays because the synchrotrons give much better x rays, you are automatic things that can use very small crystals, etc. etc. So there are uh, clear improvements, but still it's very difficult, particularly for membrane proteins and for large proteins and for proteins that are very dynamic, that are very flexible, you can't really get good crystals. So often you try not only as one protein, you can try be all homologs a big family, and if someone works for some reason, someone does not work, or you try a combination of proteins, or you try to add drugs and add things to that. But still, it, 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 so that takes time. But really, main problem is to get the crystals. My overexpression of protein, purification of protein, and the crystals. That other main technique is NMR, so nuclear magnetic resonance, that's uh, been around for another 20 years, something like that. Or more, 30 years probably, and uh, it has similar problems. You don't need to get crystals, but you need to have quite high concentration of pure protein. So you need to express it and purify it and make sure that it's stable for quite a long time in a high concentration. And many proteins are not. And there's also limited in size. The NMR doesn't work for too big proteins or too big complexes. Nowadays, they also starting to become cryo electron microscopy, as I talked about yesterday. There are, that are, but that, that, that is only applicable for large complexes because there's a size, if it's too small, it doesn't really work. So, how, so that, that means that actually uh, to have computational methods to get structure is very important. So that's why we have structure prediction. And I will, and therefore, it's fun to do it because you can, it also a related feature you like for engineering, anything that are related to these things. Can I get this to skip? Um, so why do you want? Uh, but anyway, so <coughs> the structure nowadays one, one main re reason for it is to get one main thing is like basically try to science. Basically, you have something binding here, and you want to find small molecules to balance there. Small molecules are off. Are the best drugs. Sometimes we have a drug should be you should be able to eat. They should be stable in the stomach and be able to enter your body easily. And uh, if you have big molecules like proteins and that, they're often degraded. So finding something that binds into small pocket structure is a common way 
that, p that the pharmaceutical industry make new drugs. So they really are, and th their real structure helps a lot. It's not, of course, there are many drugs made before you had a structure, so I mean, it's not the only way to do it, but in basically every single drug that's developed today, it's, it's a part of the process. It's not, it's not a, you get a structure, you get a drug, but it's really, it's a part of the pipeline that people use. As I said also, you can find homologs. So you really can classify things into, if you find a structure similar, you can find, uh, ho ho best to find decent homologs. At least that used to be the case. Nowadays, I would say it's not so important. Basically, just because the sequence matches much better. And we have more data. It's also the lo large, for a while at least, was a large classification of genome characterization. So we don't describe all the, pr all the proteins in the genome because you can find these distance homologs to have the structure based on it is, is kind of useful. So there are, have been these kind of questions, how many different structures exist? How many different dis structures are different between human and uh, mouse? And so you have this type of thing. So that's been very useful, that but that's basically because we are better clustering the structure in the group than we are at clustering the families. Or the sequel families. So okay, so so you know all this would uh, argue that it would be very useful to have a computational methods to get to a structure. However, it's not that simple. So what is it that terms to put a structure? Well, it is quite well established that. All the information that's needed for getting a protein structure is in the amino acid sequence. So it's not dependent on uh, the context, really. A protein, most proteins, let's skip the exceptions, have one stable, more or less, confirmation. And that is completely determined by, this, by the uh, amino acid sequence. So there are um, normally. I mean, so the experiments here was of Anfinsen, so in the 70s. So basically, it took lysozyme, and what it shows is that if you unfold lysozyme, so if, you, if, you, if you heat it up, be careful, you don't boil it completely, or if you add some salt or pH changes, then it unfolds, then you can get it to fold back. So this shows that the free energy minimum, the stable state of the protein, is really one state, and it doesn't really matter. You can unfold it and fold back to the same thing. case. It's not always the case that you that you can do that with every protein because some proteins get stuck somewhere else. But in the general, and there are actually enzymes, so-called chaperones, that help in this process. So some proteins need are harder to do it with. But in general, the idea is that there's not like this protein folds like that this time, and it, if you have it in some other condition, it folds something in some other way. It's basically either it misfolds and gets stuck somewhere, or it folds to one simple, simple structure. Uh, however, the confirmation of space is really. So there's a fam famous Leventhal's paradox. If you just take an amino acid sequence, and you maybe have 100 amino acids, and you have three rotations against each rest, you have three potential phase rest, you can rotate against each, each bond there. The number three to 100 is extremely big. It's big more, it's a bigger number than all the atoms in the universe. It's like 10 to 30, something like that. So it's a gigantic number. So you can't really try all possible confirmations and see which one has the lowest energy. So the idea was if you had a good energetic function, you want to describe the protein, and you just would throw, try all combinations, you would maybe be able to find the best one, but you can't do that. And the same thing, of course, that also means that a protein that folds, so the fold is a, that goes from the unfolded to the folded state, cannot do it either. Because if you would go through all the states, it would take an infinite amount of time. So there is some kind of pathways that are, or no, people normally talk about funnels. So the funnels they kind of uh, bring uh, this uh, that that guides the folding. So, but to study computation, we need to. <coughs> Uh, somehow simplify the model. So, the amino acids, 
it was just a quick repeat about thing. So primary sequence, well, it's this primary structure. People call someone. I, I don't like the word primary structure, but people use it. Well, at least used to use it. So six amino acids. It is some amino acids. And amino acids look like that. So it has an amine group, a carboxyl group, and a side chain. The key thing here is that the side chain is different between every amino acid. So you have 20, normal 20 amino acids in, in the longest. You have a couple of variations that are like selenium, thionine, and things like that. that are, but you normally have 20. So there are some modifications that occur post photosynthesis. I mean, there are several modifications that happen. You can put a glycosylation groups, it's phosphorylation, etc. There's nothing that ha can happen, but in general, there are 20 amino acids there. Like and this can be grouped into proper different properties. You have all the 20 that look like that. Some are long, basically carbon, <coughs> carbon groups, and some are round, some, some are more halophobic, some are charged. And some are, is that, so there are different uh, properties of these. So basically, you can divide them into size properties, side of publicity property, charge property, property, polarity, etc. So, these are the, so the, the order of these really determines the structure of it. So you really, it's, it's very different if you look, you take a polymer you have in a plastic bag, like that, which has kind of a random position, they really have, it makes it fold up to a fixed structure. So if you group them like that, they say they're not, they're not uh, these are positive, these are polar groups, so they're kind of overlapping. And they're small, well, these are very small and small. So if there's glycine, it's very small, and you can have aromatic, which are uh, this group here, and you have the hydrophobic ones, enclosed the aromatic one, but not, well, not really sure tyrosine should be called hydrophobic, but it's somewhere in between, yeah. So I mean, there are different groups, and they're overlapping, so they're not, they're not really. <coughs> I mean, it's not easy to classify in one dimension, you need two or three dimensions, or at least three dimensions, probably. But you can even have six amino acids. Uh, so, there's one more thing you should know about, think about it. Is that they have a chirality, so there are two types of amino acids. L and D, but in nature, basically, we only found L. It's, one, it's not really clear why it's like that, but it's no, I don't think that's the fundamental reason why we couldn't have D all over cell instead. But it's probably a mix of, uh, uh, probably the mix would be hard. So basically, see here, in this case, the, the L points this direction, uh, while this one is turned around. So this, is, uh, this has a mirror image of each other. Mm. But there are some cases, so that's a mean that can produce the amino acids. There are cases that they were used, but it's not very common. So we can ignore them. Key concept, of, uh, other key concept of the amino protein is the peptide bond. So basically, if you have a reaction where you take two amino acids and you fuse them together <coughs> and form what's called a peptide linkage here. So this is the carbonyl amine group linkage here. So that, that is that normal fusion, uh, fusion mechanism. And, but this one has bit particular properties. It's basically this uh, proton is kind of shared here. Uh, this bond here is shared here, so it becomes like a very inflexible bond. So basically, it's basically always pla flat. You can actually see some transformation, but it's very rare. Well, it's only in cysteine where you can switch between them. Almost. So basically, it's very flat. So it means so you, you would imagine you would have three degrees of freedom. You can rotate around this bond, this bond, and this bond in an amino in a protein. So you have three degrees of freedom for each um, amino acid, assuming that the bond lengths and bond angles are fixed, which are a rough approximation. But this one is actually basically always playing there. So that means that uh, you only have two degrees of freedom. I guess all the biochemists already know this. If not, really, you have to ask. So, as I said, we talk about dihedral angles, so rotation around bonds has a major flexibility in, in, in any polymer. 
But the bond bond length are just vibrating with the left. And bond angles are also often quite small vibrations, so they have a fixed value. So, so most of the large scale motors are rotations around the bond. So you can define it like a 1, 2, 3, 4. Well, 1, 2, 3, 4 atoms, and you have rotation it. So this is the phi bond here between the C alpha and the uh, amine group, and the psi bond, which is between the C alpha and the next uh, common group. Uh, so you have these omega angles, but it's basically all peptides, so that's the, the, the one that's marked here. And basically it's all those planets are, in almost every case it's 180 degrees. So phi is around the NC alpha and psi is around the C alpha. So if it's these two, so if you want to look at, the, describe the, pro, the structure of protein, these two angles are enough. So you need two, two variables for each. Um, I mean acid. Then of course that doesn't describe exactly the position of every atom, but this one, of course, you know the direction of it. And of course, they can be, can be uh, rotations in, in the side chains also, but they they only determine that locally. They don't affect the rest of the structure. So really, you could quite accurately describe the general outline of protein by just having two variables per amino acid. And actually, even though even if you look computationally, there are methods that are given these two values, given the backbone, you can build this quite accurately if you have a good backbone model. So this is back to your question here. So we had the center, we had the primary structure, the secondary structure, so primary structure, primary structure which is basically the sequence. So that's what A, C, W, T, L, that's just the amino acids in the one order. And then you have the secondary structure that I'll talk more, more about. So that is really determined by these phi psi angles. So like in, there are, this is a helix. So then we have very fixed phi psi angles here that are particular numbers, and then the form here. But you can have others also. But then these secondary structure elements form up to form a tertiary structure. So for a for a well, for some time it was believed that very much like this may be formed first, and then they somehow more got together like that. Most studies of putting folding today doesn't really show that. It's really that these are actually folding up. Uh, well, this this second aspect of falling during folding. So it's really doesn't have the value. They have the four helices first and then they fold together. It's really you often have some kind of forming core that's fold together and it kind of expands from that. And then you have the more important aspect is basically to take several of these proteins together and make it be complex. That is quite common. It's not that all proteins look like that, but this looks like a, this looks a bit like a hemoglobin, which is a one, which is actually a tetramer. One, two, three, four. So that's four, actually not four identical copies. There are two types: the two alpha, two beta. And but they are very they are homologous. So, so in the genome, so as, as, as back to what we talked about the other day, it's like once upon a time you had a um, the application, so you had two genes, one hemoglobin alpha and one hemoglobin beta, and then they form a tetramer in the coordinate structure that is, uh, uh, because it's these four molecules, so two alpha and two beta. Uh, do you know why? Why do you have, actually this looks like a myoglobin also. So myoglobin are in the muscles, that is the oxygen binding molecule in the muscle. And basically, there's also a homolog, so it's another gene application. These are hemoglobin, so what we have in the blood. So what is the difference between the oxygen binding in the muscle and the blood? So, of course, I guess we all know that we breathe air, we get oxygen. So it has to, oxygen has to bind in the, in the lung to something, it has to be transferred through the lung into the blood. But then it has to be released in, in the uh, muscles that needs it, or an organ, any organ that needs it. Brains also, and things like that. So how do you make that work in a good way? And being efficient, because basically what you want... Let's see if I still have a gun, yes. Let's see if you have a lung here. Uh, 
And then, uh, so here we want oxygen to come, and then we have the blood circulating in the body. And then we have that strong one with the muscle here, and the oxygen should end up there. And then it should go back here, and of course, why it has to go by the heart also. But that's more detail. Uh, but, uh, so we want to have some molecule that has, right, you can think about oxygen pressure, you can think about how much is the so basically, you have some oxygen level. Because in the, in, the, in the air, we have transferred oxygen. Something like that. But you, but you want to have basically all the hemoglobins, when they leave the, leave the lung, they should be all have oxygen. And basically, when they come back, you don't want to have any of them to have it. So you want to have something that goes like, if you look at fraction oxygen per hemoglobin molecule. So if you're in the, in the lung, you want to go that. So if this is the lung, and this is a muscle, and this is the lung, again, you want to do go, to go like that. You basically want it to take all the, all the oxygen you have, bind it here, and then release it in the lung. So of course you, you need to have some kind of, uh, but, um, so here you have the hemoglobin. Well, then have, here you have the myoglobin, so you want that to basically take all of it. So one way to do that is actually that, so the myoglobin has, I mean, the bindings, of course, depends on just the fraction. There's no more chemical reactions. But one way to do it is to have the, that the, you have an, um, the hemoglobin molecule. It's not just a, like a linear increase with, um, so if you have a fraction bound and you have oxygen pressure, basically. So the hemoglobin molecule does not just increase linear or something like that. It has a very, very strong profile like that. So it really is like all bound or all not bound. But then, then it has a bit, they have a bit easier to bound by oxygen to the, to the myoglobin, so that basically means that here, basically as get, in the lung, everything gets bound, and when it gets back here, in the muscle, everything gets released, and myoglobin can bind there. And the way, it, it, because it's like these four molecules here, <coughs> it's like one, one oxygen binds one of them, it's a small, small confirmation change, that makes it easier to bind to so you bind one oxygen per molecule, one per protein. So that means it's a small structural change that makes it easier for the other three to bind oxygen. So it's a very subtle change, but it's, it's that's, that's uh, why, how hemoglobin can be such a good, of like, having a very, being good to either completely bound or not bound. If you had another myoglobin there, you would have much le less difference. So that is something you realize by studying, well, not only the structure, but studying the physiology, I think that, but it's proof. But really, the structure changes there. So you have molecules that you have structures, we have it with weak bound oxygen, with bound carbon monoxide, with one bound oxygen, and you try to get the structure in different ways. It's very hard to get one with one bound, with only, so, with only one bound oxygen. Because that's basically always bound, not bound, but I guess you can get some mutants like that. So the number of myoglobin and hemoglobin structures in the, in the databases. Huge, I don't know exactly, but there are probably hundreds of them. Okay, so back to structure. Uh, in short, this is just uh, you can get computation methods to do structure prediction in at least three different ways, but they are well, here, you can call it four, but that's they are really not that easy to over. over that overlap. There's a clear, large overlap in the matter. So basically, you, you can do it by comparing the modeling or full recognition. These are so basically that means, as I said, that the structure is conserved between the two different homologs of proteins. So if you had a structure of one protein and you have a homologous sequence and you make an alignment, you can basically use this to build a model. This. So we'll talk about that in the, in, the, in later next week. So today we're talking about secondary structure prediction. So you basically say, okay, we, we, can, we can't go to 3D, so let's go to 3D prediction. And then at the end we talk about, actually, if you really have the folding, if you really could discover any well, you could just simulate it and let it fold fast enough, or do some other tricks. And I will talk a bit about that also in one lecture, because that's a new, quite exciting in the results here. But today we will focus on the secondary structure. As I said, uh, confirmation structure can be described by the phi psi angles. And these are, so in the 
three different types of, well, in the two different types of secondary structure, they are quite fixed. In the beta sheet or in the helix, his five triangles have, have quite limited space. While in the loop, they can contain more, more different numbers. But uh, if you have a beta turn, you have specific numbers also for these things. So, can we... Mm. Yeah. So, as I said, I had, this is the element. So, you can make from a structure, you can extract the element. Because you can try to identify this. We have a beta strand, we have a helix, we have lots of some turns, or some bends that can be important to also those. So, one, one problem here is we need to classify this. Uh, so you have to say, I mean, it's obvious this is a helix if you look at that, but this is actually a program that has assigned this to helix and visualized the helix, because this, this is not the structure direct, this is a visualization of the structure. So there are tricks that people, there like are programs that could do it, and basically what you do is that you, you go back to this one and you look at the hydrogen bonds. So you do a helix, the reason why this is stable, so this is Linus Pauling's work in the 50s. It's that you can form higher bonds here, or there, or here, in the beta strand. So, like, so if you find these higher bonds in your structure, you, you can define quite easily say that it's a sheet to here. But in some cases, it's always easy. The problems are mainly at the ends. When does it, is this a helix, or does it end here or here? Does the strand end there or there? So that's always a bit, bit tricky. But there are programs that can do it. There are programs like the SSP and Stride that can do it. They do not agree perfectly, but they are kind of, kind of, in general agree, but also visually by structure all these people look at it and design things. Okay, so these five psi angles, in order omega, describe the secondary structure, describe the, if you have them accurate enough, you can describe the same thing. thing. Decide the whole, well, decide the whole backbone structure. If you plot this in what's called a Ramachandran plot, yeah, we had the angle between what? Minus 180 and plus 180 degrees. And you look at it, either you, you look at it from uh, yes, of statistics, we can actually look at it by modeling what, what, feature, what, what, what part of this space is um, allowed. So really, can you say something about, um, it, it, can it be any number here? Or is it just that some areas that are allowed? And if you can actually model it, and you see, realize that some of these angles are impossible because they're going to have collisions, they're going to have atoms that for, for go into each other. So you're going to have basically these two areas with small loop uh, that are mostly allowed. There are some areas here in particular. So, there are, uh, so this is the alpha helix area. With some variation of alpha helix, it's called 310 helix and pi helix that are also helical structures. And then there are the beta sheet areas. So the beta sheet areas are a bit bigger, there's more flexibility, they don't have to be perfectly straight. Uh, but so there are, if you look at the data, uh, you see that there are these examples of structures. You can see that you have this. So one thing actually, when you solve a structure, if you look at get a, get a piece of structure, or an NMR structure we've in, is that you plot this, your five psi angles from the model you make and make sure that you don't have too many outliers because the number of outliers is often if you have too many outliers there's probably something wrong with your model it's probably not a very good model I mean it could be a few outliers there's some one outlier here but, but in all cases of course there are outliers but, it's, but it should, if there are too many that's a good indication that your model is actually quite bad and so in general it should follow kind of this because this is the stable confirmation yeah, so in general you see this is an upper helical area and this is a beta sheet area So, one question we can ask then is um, uh, can we predict the secondary structure? Can we get from, we know that, we know that the amino acid sequence determines the secondary structure, it determines the structure of protein, but that's also determine the secondary structure. And in, and in that case, why? Or in the, also, 
how can we then use this information predicted? And when the short answer is yes, it does. It's, it's not perfect, but we have quite a lot of information. Good. And there are, I don't know, this one I want to see. Mm. So there are, if you remember, for instance, one th thing is that you can have um, these patterns that we find with this multi six alignment. We could see in a multi six alignment if you have every second, uh, I mean, as in hydrophobic, every second hydrophilic, that was often a surface exposed beta sheet. So if you could have a pattern recognition that, you could say, ah, this is most likely beta sheet. So maybe not always the case, but in an average, you would do better than a random at least. And there are also some amino acids that prefer to be in the helix of strand. And uh, so there are, there is a lot of information in the amino acid sequence that can be used to predict the secondary structure. So, and the reason is, of course, because there are physical reasons why some amino acids prefer to be in one uh, sequence, or one secondary structure type. And basically, the main thing is the side chain confirmation of entropy. It's basically, if you have a side, well, also space. So, of course, if you, if you fix it in a helical position, you, you, you reduce the entropy a lot. So that is it's a cost. So there are opposing forces. So anything, anything that forces something to fix is going to be forced. But that, uh, compensation for that is that you can find a major hydrogen bonding. So if you can get, you don't have to have exposed polar residues. So there are, uh, so for instance, a shorter non branch side chain will have loss, less anthropic loss. So an alanine, which is only a short one uh, atom side chain, one metal group side chain, has a higher tendency to be in the helix than a leucine that's as long as side chain. Well, an isoleucine is even a bit lower because it has a brand side chain, so it's, it's a, well, they are chemically identical, or well, identical, but they are chemically the same I mean, atoms, but this is branch, so that means that it's. Um, uh, has a bigger anthropic cost of being in the helix and valence in the helix. Valence is typical thing that was in, in the beta sheet, but actually the beta sheet where it can turn around a lot. But the other factors also that you have hydrophobicity is a major factor. That that's, you want to have hydrophobic reaction and pattern of hydrophobicity is very important, uh, etc. So, and there are also, if you look at the helix, there's one factor here. So you have here, but you see that all this hydrogen bond points one direction. And you know that there's polarity in the, in the so you, all, you see here you have red and blue things. So you have all the, uh, I guess this is the uh, carbon group, that so oxygen is red and the, and the nitrogen is blue. So and the oxygen point one direction and nitrogen point another because you're going to have, although there's no, no charge in this molecule, there's going to be a dipolar moment. Like you have a dipole, like a magnet, point one direction and another direction. So therefore, at the end, you often want to compensate for that. So that's like you have a capping of it. Uh, so there are, and there are features. So if, if you do a kind of low, so you, that, that can be seen. To some extent, if, if you do a log of a, of a helix, I guess this is where you see that alanine is the most frequent amino acid. There's actually alanine and here. See so if you have the valine, I don't know if you can see the valine, it's probably down uh, somewhere there, I guess. I don't know, it's probably something black. So it's probably, well, yes, yeah, it's, it's less common. The isoleucine is also less common, as I said. So the alanine, the short amino acids are, you see that you have. Red charges here, more blue, more blue charges here, and that's for the capping. So this is the end term, this is C term, I guess. So you have, and you have a tendency to have more lysine. You see the lysine is more common than the arginine because lysine has a shorter side chain. So there are a lot of physical chemistry reasons, just from statistics looking at, uh, at the helix. So this is something typical, and the machine should be able, the computer can be quite good at learning. Similar in sheets, so you, don't, you have parallel and anti-parallel sheets, also mixes of these, but in general, every sheet, uh, 
But here, of course, you have every side chain pointing up and down, so you don't have this dipolar moment. But the ends are a bit, often a bit special because you have to compensate for turns into that. So that's often the turns can be quite short. So if you look at middle strands, it has a tendency that looks like towards the ends, you have glycine, for instance, quite often, that is a flexible side chain, that is, mine doesn't have a side chain at all, it's just a hydrogen, so it makes it more, more flexible. But here in the middle, you have valine, those are in isos quite frequently. And the charged ones are less common here. And there are some license, but they are not that big. Cool. So there are clear patterns here that recognize it. In general, the beta strands are short and here this is, so this is, I don't know, this is minus, I guess five, position five is the average for everything else, I guess. Um, you also have particular patterns for turns, for instance, you have type one and type two beta turns. So they are hydrogen bonds that are formed exactly this way. So this is a, and in this case, I think it needs to be a glycine in one position, etc. So these are glycine proglines very much. I don't know if it had to be, but there are but the, the two types of turns that are stabilized by hydrogen bonds like that. And the patterns with these are, I mean, again, this is general for but most of the turns, I would say, are, are much longer, so they are more random here. And here you see, you have a tendency to have more resins, <coughs> but it's and more charged residues here, the under red and blue ones, but, and that's hydrophobic, but it's, it's uh, particularly, there are, there's more resin glycines and proglines are quite frequent in the middle of the turns, particularly. Or coil readings. So there are clear patterns here, but it's, it's a large overlap also. Mm. Okay, so let's um, just mention what, so what, what can we do to predict this. So this is just basically how well we can do it. Uh, and uh, I will talk about these methods after the break. But basically, in somehow, starting with the shoe fastman methods in the 70s, you had in the order 50% correct second side prediction. Then there was the Gore methods that was probably state of the art until almost 1990, which had in the order of 60%, 65%. There, there, was, always a, there was almost a big fight to get up to 70%. And it's not. Uh, and then, then it's uh, today in PhD was the first method that really broke 70% clearly, and that got 72 when it probably you would do 74, 75 today because it has more sequence data. Cypher does 70, 76, and it's probably up to close to 80. So we, have, we, are, we are somewhere at 80% accuracy. And the reason why we don't do better is because. Well, the agreement between one is one reason at least is because the agreement between classification is not much more than 90%. So it's like if you have DSSP and Strive, which are two programs that assign secondary structures, and they agree to like 95% between each other, and the, with PDB classification they are around something like 93%. And even here you have like for identical sequences, you have maybe 90% agreement only. So if you have two crystal forms with the same protons, they're not always the same. And then there are other methods like that they only agree to 85% or so 80% of that. I don't even know what these methods are. So in general, around 90% is probably what would be expected. The rest are always going to be some differences, and particularly in the ends and the beginning of helices and sheets, exactly what is the first residue, exactly what is the last residue. So that is not always, uh, so it's not really consensus between every method. Okay, so after the break, I will talk about some of these secondary structure prediction methods. So any questions? To get, to get anything, but, but this uh, can be passed whenever you want, basically. Uh, so okay, so this is basically <laughs> how good things are. Let's look at percentage accuracy. Uh, I was actually going to show. Uh, Okay, so the first method is that was developed was actually by Shaw and Fassman. So what they basically did is take these logos that we had. My logos were not invented in this time, but they, they could have taken logos that added, and uh, they tried to calculate probability to find 
mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, in alphabetics to compare to somewhere else, or in a beta sheet to compare to something else. So the propensity, alphabetical propensity, and a beta to, uh, propensity, and a term propensity. So you see, if adenine has a high propensity for being alpha and lower for the other ones, why this is 1 times is 1.42. So it's basically has a log odds. So I know it's not even log odds, it's just the, the fraction found. And you see valine, which I guess is the last one, yeah, it's alphabetic. Has a high propensity to be in beta, but not not extremely low, but still over actually mainly doesn't find in terms at all. It's, it's still basically equal likely as expected by chance to be in an alphabetic. Glycine, you have a very high chance of being in turn, and the proline, you have a very high chance of being in turn also. And also, actually, serines also. So, you have this. Uh, so, you can get all these numbers. And then, basically, what, he, what they did was to set up some rules. You assign all the residues in the peptide to a proper set of parameters. You scan you through here, and if you find a region, so you, you classify them into like strong alpha helix form, form, a weak alpha helix form, a strong beta form, and, and ones that are against alpha helix. So you have these groups. So. so if you find your group, uh, if you find something, um, four out of six residues that are, have a P alpha helix higher than 100, then you assign it as a helix, and if it's longer than that, and then you use the same thing for B sheets, and then you. Uh, so and then, I mean, you sh yeah, you do that for the whole sequence, and you send for beta sheets, and, and then you take basically everything else you call a loop. Alright, so that, that doesn't rule that. The problem was actually, even their method, they claimed when they did it that the prediction never quite worked well, but if, even if it's not actually very easy to implement it, it's not exact implementation in the, in the computer method, because it was really, some of these things are actually not uh, obvious what you should do with. So so what, and once you try to make a computer program, it actually works slightly worse. So the accuracy is actually was around 50%. But it works somehow anyway. And the reason why it's not more than 50% is basically because this secondary structure is context dependent. So this is the same peptide, so the same amino acid sequence, K, G, W, P, Q, L, B, K, that is marked in red. In this case, it's in a beta sheet. Part of it. In this case, it's in a helix. So it really the same peptide can, but Shufasma would assign it to one of these or something else. It was the same, the same assignment. It doesn't look anything else. You look at this region here. So if it would be, so really, the secondary structure is dependent on where it is in the structure, in the 3D structure, but particularly it's not dependent on the one residue. There are many residues around it. So. So basically, the people that took this into context first are some of the people that, that actually worked is the Gore, so that's also Garnier, Oscar Torp, Robson. That's version 3, but then version 1 and 2 was 3 and 4 and 5. But they, they were really, I think there was a method that kind of superseded earlier methods by significantly doing better performance. I mean, there was a number of methods developed, but it, it's also it's quite nice to understand because really it takes a similar approach to basically all other later methods. There were other methods developed also, but methods actually completely physics based. Or were basically equally good and so on, but this is kind of easy to understand. Uh, and the idea here is really that you want to take the influence by neighboring residues. So you said we had this helix capping. So if you have a capping uh, in one position that looks like a capping residue, you know that you ha have a helix before that, and not after it, for instance. And you know that, of course, one, I mean, as the whole con so you can look at the window, basically. If you want to predict the second attack of one residue, the whole idea is that you look at the window. <laughs> and uh, so they, but but they start with the same type of st statistics basically. How likely is it that the second structure is dependent on amino acids propensities? This is the sure first one. The difference is basically that they do it. Let me move this slide otherwise. Just get 
as well as Lila's in the wrong position. Uh, this one should be. So that's no, I should work. So, so uh, yeah, so the, the, and the, there are dues in the order sixty-seven percent. So there was there was for a long time in the early, late eighties, early nineties. Was that was basically how did you do? You know. So the idea is basically that you take one position in the middle that you want to predict the secondary structure of, and you look at the window of residues before and after that, and then basically you calculate the probability. That this residue in the middle is an alpha helix, for instance, given that you have a certain amino acid type in the position in the middle, given that you have a certain amino acid type in the position one before, or two before, or three before, or one, two, three, four after, etc. So basically, so if you go far too far away, the sequence will be, uh, you know, the probability will be basically. Uh, one for everything because it doesn't, doesn't affect it. But certainly, this neighboring residues, the probabilities that what you have there is kind of important. So you sum up, uh, but when you, you don't sum up the probability that this is a helix. Sum, uh, you sum up the probability that you have a battalion in this position and the position and uh, that the residues three residues before is a helix. So these statistics you guys can calculate. From observations, and you can get all the probabilities, and you can get the sum of them. So, uh, so basically, you assume that the amino acid is influenced by flanking positions. So, you have the probability to have a secondary structure in position J, or you take a log of it, and uh, given that amino acid A is found in position I plus J, and you have there. And you have j going from minus 8 to, so in this case, you have a window of 17. And then uh, you sum up all, all this, uh, divide by, uh, yeah, I mean, take it for all amino types. So, and s is one of these, so you do this for helix, sheet, and uh, loops. You have three, three different secondary structure class classes. So in the case like that, you have here, you have this. So how likely is it is that you have a position zero, you have eight residues before, you have a triple time. How, how, how often do you see a helix triple time, eight residues before, a helix residue? And then you just do this, you take it through every amino acid in your sequence and every position, and you have the window here, and you go through every position in your sequence, and you will get one number for probability to be in a helix, probability to be in a V sheet, probability to be in a turn, and you just take the biggest of these numbers. That's the prediction. So this is how the table looks like. Or this, this is some part of the original table. It's only yeah, it's position eight. So, so you see, yeah, and this is the log odds number, sometimes hundreds of that. So for instance, if you see the position zero, position J, if you take your favorite here, alanine, it has a, I guess this is to be alpha helical. You have a high number, sixty-five, but while the valine, which is not alphabetic, is fourteen, which is lower. While for instance, you have. Uh, Tyrosine is minus 45. It's very unlikely to be a helix there. Actually, it's very likely to have a tyrosine in any position close to this one. Because if this is a helix, it's likely this is also a helix here. So this tyrosines are always in the, everywhere here, so it's unlikely. So anything in the vicinity of a tyrosine is not likely to be a helix. Or a glycine, the same thing here. But you see the drop off at the end. Yeah, here basically everything gets very close to zero. But, and you see that, for instance, you have uh, alanines are quite strong here, all the way in the middle. But also glutamate, and you see here you have a tendency that glutamates, because of this capping, have high numbers in the C terminal and the N terminal. And lysines and histidines, for instance, lysines and histidines and arginine, I will guess. Uh, well, lysines has the same tendency down there. Arginine is actually much more a breaker down here than it's actually fine here, most likely, because it's a longer side chain. So. 
and behaves slightly differently. So you say, all in life behaves actually quite differently. This is really no influence at all here, but a positive influence here, this is a positive influence here, and no influence there. So you really can get to the statistics. And then if you want to predict, if you have the sequence, you just take your sequence, you take these numbers, and add them together. And you get the prediction. And as I said, you end up. Um, this one, I don't know. Basically, you end up with something with about 65, 67 percent uh, accuracy. So this is basically how, what the state of the art was in 1990 and uh, 90, well, early 90s. There were some problems with this. I mean, the prediction 65 percent is okay. Two thirds is correct. But if in three states, it wouldn't be that bad, but it's the, the uh, in g a problem was that this prediction didn't really look like secondary structures, they're often too short. So they often, if you have, even if you, have, so you didn't have a helix, you want to have a helix, you want to be seven as long, you don't want to have helix, loop, helix, loop, helix, loop, predict like that. And uh, you don't, and the prediction was also significantly worse for beta strands than for half helices. Because uh, they are probably less information, but the chances are shorter, so they have less like, information, less conservation of them like that. So basically, often things, even if they are 65% correct, it often looks something like that. So this is uh, the observed, so you have a sheet, and you have so basically one, two, three, four sheets, and then there's some the rest of you see the exercise of sheets also in the loops in between. But sometimes you have here the sheet misc predictions here, and actually uh, you have, although I think the numbers are not that bad, you have quite a lot of accuracy, and probably 60% correct. It doesn't really, you can't really say that it put has four sheets. It's a, you have no real idea if you actually sheet to hands. So, how do you solve this problem? Um, so, the, this was basically one of the obvious things that people could do, but actually, it was not so obvious at the time, maybe, or it was maybe not so easy to implement at the time. But it was clearly a breakthrough. So this is Burkhard Ross and Chris Sander, that's other people, but Burkhard Ross was the main author, who did this in early 90s, so 93 or 92, I don't remember the first paper. And that was the first secondary structure prediction method that really did more than 70%. So 65 to 70 is not such a big difference, but really it, it made the secondary structure prediction much, much more accurate. And basically the same methods today give get up close to 80%. Just because we have more data, more or less, more or less. some re minor changes only. Uh, and the idea here is really what has been used ever since in basically ev well, in many biophysical methods is to use evolutionary information. So really, you do not do the prediction for a single sequence, you actually do the prediction for a large set of um, for a put of family, so you take all the homologs together and do the prediction of everything together, and you assume then that, that these predictions are identical uh, between all of these. And that's probably true. It's probably tr the, the, the most common well, average is certainly true. There are variations, but this is a really powerful idea to use all this evolutionary information. So. If we go back to so another thing that they used, but they were not the first people to do, if you look at this slide, this very much looks like a narrow network. You remember this target P that we did? We talked about the other day. You have a window, and then you have some input numbers here, and then you have the prediction output. So what is missing here is basically these hidden layers. So otherwise, it basically is a network. Right? It is a network. You can have a narrow network like that, but you don't have. But in the target P, we had the hidden layer also. So, in this hidden layer, what is good about it is that you can use cross correlations. You can say, if this is something high and this is something low, I get a, good, get a high number, but if this is high and this is high, I get a low number. So, you can get this kind of cross validation things. And the machine can learn it itself. They were not the first people to use neural networks, as used before for secondary science prediction, but th this, these two combinations of uh, multiple sequence alignment and neural networks was really powerful. So the idea is basically very much rough outline here is that you take a sequence, as you do always, you do a database search. In this case, you have to use BLAST. And then they use programs called Max Home 
basically this, that that filter is output to some kind of sequence to, to find the homologs, and you make an alignment, uh, multiple six alignment that. So nowadays, this is basically like, like side loss. You can think when they did an X alignment, they had an X filter as well. These kind of methods have kind of died out. Nobody uses them any longer. But the ending here is that you get a multiple sequence alignment, and you use this multiple sequence alignment as an input to neural network, and then you do second class prediction. So this is very much a standard pipeline for any bioinformatics work today. Well, not any, but for any sequence bioinformatics work. That you take a sequence, you run BLAST or CyBLAST or Jackhammer or HSPs or something like that, and you get an alignment. You must take the alignment from that directly normally, and you put it into some machine learning method. You can use other methods. So, how do you get the alignment input? So basically, if you remember, we went coded things for a neural net. We used this sparse encoding. We had zeros and ones. For, we had 20 vectors, a uh, vector of 20. There were one zero, zero, zero of alanine, zero, one, one, one of cysteine, etc. You can do the same thing here. Here, take the frequencies. So in position one, you have F and uh, I don't know, I can do H, I guess, and E and H, bad letters. There from the paper, so you have you have some kind of uh, uh, frequency of amino acids. So you have count how often you find each amino acid. So you have five different amino acids. Here's one you find four percent, and this one is one hundred percent conserved, for instance. Why is only one amino acid? That's histidine. So this is your multiple alignment. So basically, instead of putting in zeros and ones, you put in a number here, which is at least just a frequency of the amino acids. So basically, someone not said, yeah, but this is a very short multiple sequence alignment. I remember this is 1990, so the database was extremely much smaller than it is today. Nowadays, of course, in most cases, you have hundreds of sequences here. And this is also why these methods are much better today than they were then, even if it's exactly the same method, yeah, because the database increase. So this is an input, quite simple to do. They added some extra information, like the uh, number of deletions and insertions you have there, for instance. And uh, conservation value here, so they have a few more variables you can put in there because you know that the conservation is much lower in a loop, and insertion deletion is also more common in loops. So that information provides extra information. So you have an order of 23, I mean, 23 uh, inputs per position, and you maybe have a window of 17, so you have 23 times 17 inputs to your neural network. Otherwise, it, and then of course, you have annotations here that are this is. Here, sheet, 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 and loop, loop, loop. So you have annotation. So you got a standard neural network training. And they have some input layer, output layer. So in this case, you would think about have three outputs. Here is sheet loop. They did a few more tricks to get the performance up over 70%. So one thing, trick actually is they used several layers. So you used a uh, first layer network, but the sequence construction network. So basically, you take this input here, and you have a window here, and you do a prediction of here, probability to be here, exceed and loop. So basically, that's very, very straightforward. But you do a couple of different versions of this. No, no, if, no well, you, you can actually do this. Uh, yeah, but you, you do this. And, but then, you also have the idea that, of course, you don't, you don't want to have a helix loop, helix loop, helix loop, helix loop. And particularly, in this case, you have, I guess, uh, I mean, it depends on the probabilities are very strong or not, but you, you know that helices should be close to helices. So the second network actually takes the predictions from the first network, and uh, so then it starts in the window of these around it, so it looks at the neighbor predictions, and then it makes a new prediction. And actually, and then you have a third level network, which actually you make this in a few different versions, you have a bit of different balance in the training, so you have different balance of number of sheet helix residues, and you do training in a couple of different ways. And then you have a jury, which actually takes pictures of, of the number of networks together, and they do it. And even have a, I think they even have a filter method, and then they, then they take the winner takes it all. So this is like, actually this method of uh, having networks that are predicting networks and predicting networks is something that is becoming very popular nowadays. It's called deep learning. It's not really exactly this way it's implemented, but it's a similar idea, and it's that's been quite a breakthrough in the machine learning community. So that's how uh, Google could find all the cats on, in YouTube. So then, uh, that's, that's a hard problem to find. Quite a lot, 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 of, lot of cats on YouTube. 
But uh, there are, I mean, instead of having one network, you have actually predict, you, you have one network that predicts something and you use this for, for as an input to the next layer. It's kind of useful. We have used it in some cases also. So here, basically, as a summary again, yeah, it's upside down here, because if you want to have an input here, 21 features in this case, you take a sequence to structure network, and then you take a structure to structure network, and you don't make a prediction. And then actually you have a URI here, that's what you have. And this URI can be a network, okay, that's really some, some, a summary, uh, average, and some things. Because there are, there are some, you can do this slightly differently. But it's all one alignment. So the difference is somehow that you actually got much nicer predictions. So this is the observe. So this is the one example. It's not the well, not the same as before. Yeah, observation is one, two, three, four, five sheets, and the short here is in between. And you see that the Schuh-Fassmann actually goes completely wrong because when they go also they predict helix here in the beginning, and here also helix. But here they have it's quite good. Schuh-Fassmann is completely wrong here, and you see that the sheet is kind of mixed with the helix in gore, and you have a sheet here. So you can, it's 59 and 65 percent correct. Still, even this. This says 65% correct, it's kind of, yeah, sure, a lot of loops are correct, correct created, but not hardly anything else. While this is only 72%, it's slightly better, you see it actually is almost perfect. Well, this part is actually not that good, it's predicted to be here instead of the sheet, but except for that, it's, it's perfect. So there is like one or two residues here missing, but that's not, well, from a structure point of view, <coughs> you can leave it at, I think. This is a really bad prediction. And also another important fact is that they said they have a reliability. This is basically just how strong is the prediction. You can take the number of, of the strongest prediction to the second strongest and have the data. Uh, if that is big difference in these predictions, it has a higher reliability and a small difference there lower. And you can see that this region here, which is badly, this number is quite low, while you have uh, this number like 8, 9, 7, in many regions it's quite reliable. But well, this is not everyone, really but you can as you get the indication that this is not as Strongest part. And it's this part either, but it's like that. When you can get an indication, you might not trust this in this case. Uh, right, so, this is the number of predictions that have been done, I guess, for some uh, servers that have been used a million times. Okay, so really to summarize this, uh, that there are uh, um, I don't know what, uh, uh, so for PG, so that it, it was important. It was the first method that actually got over seven percent, and it actually made predictions that was uh, really kind of reproduced to how secondary structure looked like. As I said, the length of the elements are quite, quite okay. It was much better than the beta strands, particularly. It's also a good correlation between score and accuracy. And it also got better prediction for larger multiple sequence alignments, means that just waiting for more sequences, you get better predictions. That's what happened now. Um, there are... Uh, Uh, the other part that is important here is really that it was basically the first method that uh, uh, that did uh, uh, that used multiple sequence alignment. Maybe not the first, but one of the first methods that actually used multiple sequence alignments. Uh, uh, so, uh, so it was the first bad method that actually used multi well, first second of picture they used multi multi alignment in an efficient way. And it really, that is something extremely important in biomass to realize that we can use it and, and use it for many different things. So that it's used, it doesn't always add the information, but of course it, it does it in many cases. Uh, so today, 
secondary structure prediction mechanisms are based on very, very similar approaches. You don't use this max home and this method for multiple signal alignments. You use Cyblast or some better method for get better alignments. That makes a big difference. One of the better method is something called Cypred, which is made, made by David Jones. He, he developed it actually for just yes, as a very simple method. So he, uh, he needed something in hand. If it was a bit of problem, maybe you couldn't really run this PhD because it was not easy to install it, to run it yourself, and then maybe the license didn't allow it. But you could run it. So he wanted to make his own method. So he do, took the same. He basically said, "Okay, I'll make something simple. I run Cyblast on a good data set. I train two layers of net neural networks to predict the secondary structure. Very much like this, uh, the, just as simple as possible. At the end, there was actually a few percent better than than, than, than the PhD, just because first the Cyblast gets better than multiple sequence alignment, and secondly." Because it was really careful in the selection of the training set. So really he had only those structures where the secondary structure was quite highly classified and it didn't use an, it was good at doing homology reduction, good at the training of the scenario network, etc. But the idea was really to start was not to make a better method, it was really uh, he needed something in-house that he could use. And he made a simple method. And then it was actually it's still state of the art. There are a few methods that are very, very similar. There are methods that are extremely much more complicated, but they are getting up to close to eighty percent, not really really eighty percent, but close to eighty percent. But and, and the difference between these methods is very sm small. However, there's always one method that's best. It's still is to do homology prediction by homology. So basically the idea we have here is that we have two structures that are hom homologous. So you have uh, the idea that uh, uh, Two proteins are um, similar. I mean, if they have similar se sequences, if they're homologous, they have similar structures. Of course, if the structure is similar, the secondary structure is also going to be similar. So, if you can make a good alignment between these two proteins, if you know the secondary structure of this protein and you make a good alignment, the parts that align together should have the same secondary structure. As I said, it's, it's up to about 90% accuracy, something, something like that. So, in cases where you have a homology to a known structure, there's no reason to do any secondary structure prediction. There are maybe a few ca cases, but it's, yeah, that's... So the IU methods actually try to combine things together, then they get up to 90%. But there has been... So basically, if you make alignment, and then, then you then you can get basically get a perfect secondary structure prediction. The different sequences, but they have the same secondary structure. So you can you can even do this for cases where you don't have very high sequence similarity. Even there are cases where you have the homology is a bit lower, but you can still do that for uh, uh, for finding the. Secondary structures. There are methods called, also called nearest neighboring methods. So you basically align your sequence against fragments of proteins with known structures, and you can calculate basically you find a lot of homologs, a lot of potential homologs, the similarities, and you calculate some, somehow the average secondary structure of these fragments you align to, and you can just filtering, and you get some pretty accuracy, which is very similar what you get with uh, the best machine learning methods. This last line, I don't know what was there. Okay, so just to sum, end up, so don't, for this lecture, don't remember, forget something on the properties of the amino acids, the peptide bonds, fine psi angles, Ramachandran plots, something about secondary structure properties, something about the machine learning methods, static methods, alignment best method and skip, but there are also consensus methods to take many different methods together, they might sometimes make one or two percent better, but it's not a big difference. So that so to, to so now you will have your oral presentations on Mon on Wednesday, tomorrow today and tomorrow you have a lot of labs, and then Monday Tuesday you have basically time to prepare for the oral presentations. And um,